Good evening and welcome you all to the workshop on simplifying sustainability for MSMEs, which has been curated to help MSMEs understand the opportunities as well as risks associated with environmental, social and governance factors. Today's session is being organized under the aegis of FIKI Center for Sustainability Leadership. The center has been established to support the sustainability journey of corporate India and equip Indian businesses, especially MSMEs, with necessary skill sets to monitor and improve their performance on ESG parameters. The center's objective is to accelerate India Inc.'s climate action in line with government's commitments enshrined in the Panchamrit framework and adoption of mission life. The Centre is committed to translate our Prime Minister's vision of making lifestyle for environment a mass movement and is geared to work towards companies adopting pathways that promote sustainable consumption, sustainable production and sustainable lifestyles. We are extremely privileged to have our partners with us for the session today. Hindustan Unilever Limited is the founding member of the FIKI Centre a company which truly believes that business must have a purpose beyond profit, which for HUL is to make sustainable living commonplace while delivering superior performance. We are joined by Mr. Prashant Venkatesh, Marketing Director and India Sustainability Head at Hindustan Unilever. In this role, he leads numerous HUL initiatives on health and well-being, on circular economy and transform. He also leads the HUL's partnerships with FIKI's Center for Sustainability Leadership. The center's knowledge partner is EQ, which stands for Engage and Empower for ESG. EQ is dedicated to transforming the climate and ESG landscape in India. Their ESG solutions support investors and companies in their ESG journeys helping develop business relevant ESG strategies and their deployment. I welcome Mr. Shankar Venkateswar, Managing Director, Sustainability Integration and Co-Founder of eCube Investment Advisors. He is also Chairman of Oxfam India. Mr. Shankar advises companies and NGOs on matters relating to corporate sustainability and sustainable development. Before we begin, we would request you to fill up a simple questionnaire to help us assess the benefits accrued from the discussions today. There is a link in the chat box which you can click on and submit the form on an anonymous basis. Please go through the questions and submit your responses over the next three minutes. While we are waiting, please note that we will take up any questions that you might have at the end of the presentations. Please type your questions and comments in Q&A box. Request you to avoid using the chat box for questions. I now invite Prashant to share his perspective on the business imperative that ESG has evolved into. Over to you, Prashant. I think our intent with this sustainability center also is to ensure that we are able to bring in new technologies into SMEs so that then we democratize clean tech in India as well and overall build the capacity of sustainability actions in India. We truly believe with the power of FIKI and with corporate leaders such as ourselves and other corporates, uh, we can transform India, climate, uh, India Inc.'s climate transformation over the next many years. Today is our first session. We really look forward to hearing feedback about what we can do better, what we can more. In fact, we invite more people to partner us on this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. May I now request Mr. Shankar to take us through his presentation? Yeah, thank you, uh, Abha, and, and hello, everyone. Uh, really delighted to uh, run the next 20 minutes of the, se of the session with for you. Let me just share my screen and the uh, presentation that I'm going to share. Uh, I hope it is uh, visible to all. Yes, it is. Okay, right. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, 
basically what I'm going to try and do in the next 20 minutes is to give you a sense uh, of the what and the why of sustainability. There is a focus, as Prashant had said earlier, and Lava on MSMEs in, in the center. So uh, that is going to also be the focus of what I'm going to present. Uh, however, we know that uh, uh, even if you're a large company, you have a lot of uh, interactions and partnerships with MSME. So uh, it, this would, in some senses, also be helpful for large companies, we hope. Uh, but this is the first of several, and, and I'm sure we would uh, be covering more and more kinds of topics which would be relevant in the intersection between the large companies and the MSMEs. Uh, this one is uh, going to be a bit more focused on uh, on MSMEs, uh, as I said earlier. Okay, so let me start by not trying to define sustainability, because that's going to be, uh, I mean, that could be an R session in itself. But just to take you through what are the, uh, what sort of constitutes sustainability or sustainable behavior, ESG behavior, or responsible behavior, these terms being used interchangeably. What does this mean? And, and what is driving this kind of an emphasis on issues that we broadly are terming sustainability? So I'm gonna start with that and then uh, get into uh, why should MSMEs focus on this? So let me just start with a larger, uh, sort of a perspective, that if you speak with CEOs, and I've spoken to so many of them, uh, and ask them what does sustainability mean for you, or what does business success mean for you, uh, they would talk about those three words that you see in the left, uh, growth, growth in uh, the company as top line, bottom line, uh, profitability, and longevity. That really constitutes business success. And traditionally, what we've always been taught, what we've always practiced, is that you need to, as uh, in order to be able to meet these three uh, parameters of success, you need to manage a whole range of issues, whether it's uh, in vis-a-vis uh, -vis your, your uh, customers, vis-a-vis -vis your competition, uh, regulations, technology, human resources, uh, and so on. So there is a whole range of factors that needs to be managed and man understood and managed well in order to be to grow, in order to remain profitable and live forever. And this is what was taught to us in business school. This is what we practice in all our companies. And absolutely, these are important. There is no question about that. What has started to emerge, uh, especially in the last few decades, is just managing just this doesn't seem to ensure success because there are a whole range of other issues that are now becoming important and managing them is also important for business success. In fact, one could go as far as to say that just managing all the stuff in black is necessary, but not sufficient to ensure success. And you've got to understand the ones that are in orange, you've got to understand them, you've got to look at and see how they impact your business and you need to also start learning how to manage them. And successful companies are the ones that understand this and manage this and manage this well. And that's really the origins of the thinking around sustainability and why sustainability is not just a nice thing to do on the side when you can do it, but it's integral to the way a business runs, a business uh, does its day-to-day -day work and therefore succeeds. And this is, really the important aspect of why sustainability is important. It doesn't matter whether you're a large company or a small company, it, uh, it, this, this is uh, important. And if, if you want some evidence to that, here is some of that that emerges. Uh, every year, the World Economic Forum uh, does a report called the World Risk Report, the Global Risk Report. And where it, it basically tries to identify what are the various kinds of issues that uh, of that form risk to businesses over two time frames, a two year frame and a 10 year frame. And they classify this into these four categories, environmental, geopolitical, societal, and technological risks. And what you see here is the most recent one that we should be, uh, the next one should be coming in January, 2024. The, Jan the January, 2023 release 
uh, this is what you can see here. And as you can see, it's a mix of all kinds. There's a, there are social issues, there are environmental issues, and there are geopolitical and, and technical technological issues that impact businesses. But you can see that the green and the, and the pinks or browns, I'm not very good with color, uh, are the ones that you can see all over splattered both in the short term of two years and in the long term of 10 years. So all of these issues therefore constitute risks for business globally acknowledged and therefore uh, needs to be managed for businesses to succeed. And so I'm just providing you additional data, if you like, on why you cannot ignore this and any company that ignores these issues does so at their own risk. Now, if these factors impact business success and therefore sustainability becomes important, what does it mean for a company? How does, what constitutes uh, sustainable behavior? And this is a, the question for the ages and there are, uh, the, good, the good thing is that there are frameworks that help companies navigate what constitutes sustainable behavior. And these frameworks have been around and they're evolving. Just to give you a sense of what the global frameworks are, the oldest really in, in this is what you see in the top left, which is the triple bottom line. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. John L. Clinton talked about it uh, towards the end of the last millennium uh, uh, and basically tried to define sustainable development from a corporate or a business lens. And basically propounded that for, for a company to remain profitable, it needs to manage its societal impacts, needs to understand them, and needs to manage its uh, environmental impacts. So that is, in a sense, the mother of all sustainability frameworks and tells companies uh, that this is what I need to do to be on this journey. And remember, sustainability is a journey. There is almost, I mean, there is a destination which we can see right in the, the distant future, but it's always a journey. You're constantly trying to get better and better at it and these frameworks help. So triple bottom line is a framework. The UN Global Compact is another framework that tries to define sustainability or help companies understand sustainable behavior uh, from, from a day-to-day -day lens. You have an ISO 26000, you have the OECD guidelines, you have the sustainable development goals. So in a sense, these frameworks are, are very helpful for companies to say, okay, this is what it means to be on this train called sustainability, move, moving towards a journey called sustainable development. There is also uh, Indian frameworks. And the Indian framework is the National Guidelines on Responsible Business Conduct. Uh, this was uh, propounded by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, in 2019. It's, a, it's an updation of what used to be called the NDGs that came out in 2011, again by the ministry. And the NGRBCs forms the basis for the BRSR, uh, which SEBI has now mandated for the top uh, 1,000 listed companies. So these are these six are, I would say, very generic, cross-cutting kinds of frameworks that are helpful to know about, to read about, to understand, and, and apply on a day-to-day -day basis. Then there are some specialized, if you like, frameworks. So the equator principles or the IFCs, performance standards, these are a set of guidelines that companies can use when you're, uh, when you're in the project mode. The PRI is something that are, is very useful for investors, the financial services companies, investors, lenders, and so on. The PRI stands for the principles of responsible investment. So again, here it tries to explain or, or provide guidances to, to uh, financial institutions as to what they need to do to be responsible, to be sustainable, uh, to be uh, following the ESG space. You have things like the GSTC, which is for tourism uh, companies, companies that are in the tourism business and, and so on. So you can see there is a myriad of frameworks. All of them basically are trying to help companies go on this journey. As, as large companies, uh, you know, these are familiar to many of them. Many of them adopt different kinds, uh, different of these, uh, of these kinds of frameworks. For, I would say for MSMEs, I would suggest that you think about these three, the UN Global Compact, 
the ISO 26000 and the National Guidelines for Responsible Business Conduct are something that MSMEs would do well to, to, to pick up, read, understand, and then uh, uh, conduct themselves or in that way so that you get onto this uh, sustainability journey. So this is the, the, the sort of a background as to what is sustainability and its relevance to, uh, to an MSM. Now let me uh, move on to why uh, MSMEs need to take sustainability uh, very seriously. Uh, and I will just talk about three sets of drivers and speak to each one of them in a little bit more detail. The first set of drivers that is important to understand are stakeholders. So all of these issues that we talked about in the earlier section, uh, they are out there for companies to see. But even if companies are not aware of it, one of the things that certainly is happening more and more are, is that stakeholders are pushing companies, urging companies, forcing companies to think about this and, do, and take it more seriously. So if you look at a set of uh, uh, stakeholders that a company has, you look at investors. Investors are pushing this agenda. And investors are pushing this agenda not because they are philanthropic in nature, it is because for them, uh, it, is, it is about the, uh, how to deal with the risks or the fear of investments that go wrong. And they are beginning to uh, understand and believe that companies, that they're investing companies that do not take sustainability seriously are at risk. Their investments are at risk, and that is their fear. Uh, whereas when, when uh, the, the uh, flip side is companies that take sustainability seriously, uh, are well in on the path to doing well, to doing uh, to being profitable, to adding value, and that is their greed. So investors are think uh, look at and and are pushing and urging companies to take sustainability seriously. Customers, of course, and, and I will speak to this a bit more. Whether you're in the B two B business or B two C business, as an MSME, customers are obviously very central to your success, and over time, customers are having expectations that are suggesting that the sustain that sustainability needs to happen and needs to be taken more seriously. Uh, employees, uh, again, an important stakeholder pushing companies, and and there is mounting evidence that employees prefer to join and stay with companies that care. And of course, communities, uh, they are the ones who provide the license to operate. So stakeholders are really pushing companies into taking the sustainability agenda more seriously. And I will speak to the MSME case a bit more on customers, uh, especially the B2B and the B2C, just to give you a flavor and some more evidence on why as an MSME, you need to do this more seriously. The other set of drivers are what are, are, are regulations. And of course, regulations, we all know as, as business people is important for us. And if you look at what's happening in the regulation space, whether it is in India or, or, or globally, there has been a tremendous amount of movement, especially in the last decade. If you look at uh, it, it, just in India, uh, uh, on the energy and waste, if you look at all of those kinds of things that are happening, whether it's the PAT, whether it's star rating of appliances, whether it's auto emissions, EPR, plastic waste, e-waste, the, there's been a slew of, of uh, uh, rules and regulations that have come in the last decade, which are pushing companies into sort of understanding this and, and adjusting their behavior in a manner that makes more sense. If you look at the social codes, the labor codes that are coming in, so there is CSR, there's the labor codes that are covering issues like safety, social security, and giving more emphasis to some of the human rights issues that Prashant, for example, referred to earlier. Uh, then, of course, there are a whole bunch of regulations around disclosures. We talked about the BRR, the BRSR, and we will talk a bit more about it. Uh, some global covenants like the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, the national, nationally determined contributions to climate change, and global regulations. So I'm going to speak to some of these regulations in a bit more detail in the subsequent uh, slides to give you a better understanding of that. And, of course, there is business risks. And some of these business risks are evident to all of us, and I'm sure all of many of you know this and are understanding this, that resource scarcity, how 
uh, resources, uh, 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 raw materials and other kinds of resources like water are, are, are incre increasingly uh, being uh, uh, are, are scarce and therefore we need to respond through things like circularity, looking at life cycle assessments and so on. We have disruptions uh, uh, on account of human rights and uh, issues and other kinds of non-compliances. So all our uh, own businesses are at risk as well as our suppliers uh, are at risk and therefore our businesses are at risk. But there's also the, the flip side of opportunities as more and more capital is moving towards and being attracted to companies that care, that uh, show, demonstrate uh, sustainable behavior. And of course, the pressure of disclosures that we talked about, which provide a risk to businesses. So it's not just uh, from the point of view of regulations asking you to do things, but the fact that regulations are moving in a particular direction means that there is greater and greater pressure. So I'm going to just speak to some of these issues in a bit more detail to get uh, for you to get an appreciation of this, and then we'll 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 take a pause and and take questions. So let me just uh, uh, talk about. Hang on, my. For some reason, my slide is suddenly stopped moving. Yeah. So those who are in the B two C business, uh, and uh, 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 those of you in in this uh, in this particular webinar in the B2C business, one of the things that is happening is that customers are actually uh, getting more and more concerned about the kind of products and the kind of processes that uh, companies are using to bring products to them. And as a result, there's been a really increased spurt of certain kinds of, of certifications. Because customers are saying, I want to be clear that the product I buy is sourced sustainably, it is produced in a responsible way, and so on. So if you're in a if you're an MSME and you're selling uh, a set of products, especially if you're exporting them, uh, you will find that a lot of these kinds of uh, standards are are becoming uh, norm, and you need to comply and you need to therefore be certified for these standards. This is increasingly becoming a requirement, even if you're yourself uh, as, a, as a company selling uh, directly to customers, to retail customers uh, across the world. But if you are a B2B business and you're, you're part of a supply chain, there too, there is a lot of such kind of pressures. So if you look at companies that you can see on this uh, particular chart, whole range of them, both global companies as, as well as Indian companies, all of them are looking at what's happening in the supply chain. They are building codes of conduct and different kinds of requirements that they expect their suppliers to comply with. And in fact, over a period of time, many of them are actually getting third party audits done to make sure that their, their supply chains are compliant with various sustainability requirements, which are written in the code covering environmental issues, covering human rights, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is both a risk and an opportunity uh, for, an S, uh, for an MSME that's part of the supply chain. The risk, of course, is that if you do not, uh, are not found aligned with these, you run the risk of not getting that business or that business no longer being there for you. The flip side is equally relevant. And I'm, there are many cases where companies, uh, have, when they find that a particular set of suppliers has actually done very well in the sustainability space, I'm happy to give them more and more orders and increase their market share. So it works both ways. It's both a risk and an opportunity, but more and more companies are looking at, at suppliers and supply chain uh, issues and, and asking and expecting suppliers to be aligned with basic sustainability principles and are independently trying to get them audited. So there is a, from a customer point of view, whether you're a B2C customer, uh, a B2C business or a B2B business, there are pressures and opportunities uh, to be sustainable. You also have a whole set of Indian regulations. Again, uh, uh, both Abha and, uh, and Prashad uh, referred to uh, India's uh, Panchamrit uh, 
uh, statements and the mission life. All of them uh, at both uh, at, at a country level and at, a, at an individual and therefore a company level, uh, there is uh, uh, almost like a commitment that we are making as a country that we are going to follow and ensure that certain things happen, whether it's the, it's the increasing use of renewable energy, uh, looking at energy efficiency, uh, net zero, uh, and the, just uh, the principle, uh, uh, the SDGs like responsible uh, production and consumption, the way our individual lifestyles are. So all of these are things that, the, that India as a country is is uh, talking about globally and therefore setting the context and setting themselves setting ourselves up to do this and for us to succeed in this it means that all of us whether you're an individual whether you're an msme whether you're a large company have a role to play in this and so this is one of the big drivers and and while these are uh, at the moment uh, some of them are in the form of intents and statements and policy pronouncements they will also start moving into regulation. It's just a matter of time. But just knowing this tells you which is the direction of travel and as companies, we can get ready for, for this kind of future. The other Indian uh, regulation that is of relevance is the BRSR. Now, the BRSR, as you know, is essentially relevant for the top 1,000 listed companies as of now. Uh, it started at 100 in 2013. It went to 2015, it went to 500, 2019 to 1000. And if you look at the direction of travel, more and more companies will be expected to report on BRSR. Uh, but if you're an MSME and you're unlisted, uh, you could think that, how does this matter to me? But the fact is it does. Because if you're, uh, if you're a, a MSME, and you're part of a value chain of a company, which is in the top 1000 in terms of uh, market cap, listed companies in the market cap, these companies have to start reporting on what is happening in their supply chains. And that is the new requirement that, that SEBI has come up with, which it announced this year, that uh, over a period of time, starting from FY24-25, value chains of the top 20, 250 uh, listed uh, companies by market cap will have to provide not only data and information on what is happening in the supply chain, but these also need to have limited assurance. So you can't just put any number there and, and get away with it. There has to be some level of assurance uh, for this data. So all of you, if you are part of supply chains and you're not listed, you're not part of the thousand, but you are supplying to one such company, you your, your uh, uh, requirement of reporting will start to increase. And this will also be subject, as I said, to some level of assurance. So, so there is this regulatory push that is very much on the horizon that requires you to sort of therefore take some of these issues more seriously. And this is just a set, this is just a quick look at what these BSR core indicators are. And these are the indicators that the value chain uh, companies who are MSMEs will also have to report on. So this is this is something that is very clear. There's a clear timetable. There's a clear process, and so we will need to, as companies, that, as MSMEs, get ready for that future. It's not very far away. Uh, what has also happened is that uh, although there is a BRSR which uh, which was created by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs. Uh, and SEBI picked it up for the top 1,000 listed companies, this committee that came up with the BRSR was very conscious and very aware that the BRSR as a document, as a requirement, is very uh, significant and it requires a lot of work uh, to, to comply, and which large companies can do so because they are geared up for this. But small companies cannot. And in order to create a, a, a disclosure framework for small companies. This committee also came up with what is called a BRSR light. Now, this BRSR light is available in the public domain. What it does is help SMEs to start thinking about disclosures in a manner that is within their, uh, their capabilities and within their, the scope of what they do. 
So I would again urge uh, you to look at, uh, this is available in the public domain, this committee report, the, the BRSR rights format is available and, and MSMEs that haven't started reporting, this would be a good way to get into the reporting space. And once you get into the reporting space, it also helps you uh, understand where you are on the sustainability journey and therefore start building strategies that help you get there. So I just thought this is a useful piece of information for you as MSMEs to look at. Now, we talked about Indian regulations. But if you are a company that's exporting, or if you are part of a supply chain of a company that is exporting, there are also global regulations that are governing this. So I'm just going to give you two sets of examples. One is uh, global uh, climate-related uh, regulations, which are already there in place in the EU. So if any of you are, uh, for you, uh, EU is an important market. Uh, there is a whole taxonomy uh, that EU has developed that tries to uh, tries to define what constitutes sustainable behavior and uh, what is an acceptable level of sustainable behavior. So that taxonomy exists, and there is a move to try and get more and more companies to comply and, and to be aligned to this taxonomy. But what is even more immediate is in the next year or two, you're going to have this thing called CBAM, the Carbon Border adjust Adjustment Mechanism. Now, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is a nice basic uh, 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 sort of words or set of words, but it's essentially what it boils down to is like a tax. So, in other words, you will end up, uh, if you are outside the EU and supplying to the EU, you will end up paying a, a, a tax. And the tax would depend on, it, it, it's, it's a slightly more complicated uh, calculation, and I'm not going to get into the calculation, but essentially what it's saying is that if you are in a, if you're, if you're producing a product in a jurisdiction that, which does not have very strong carbon or GHG emission related uh, limits, uh, but if you want to export into the EU, you cannot get away because you're uh, you're uh, you're in a jurisdiction that is less strict. You will there is a bit of a compensation that you will have to do, and that is the compensation which is the adjustment mechanism. So to, to give you in this particular example, if the uh, emission trading uh, cost uh, of carbon of GHG is seventy five euros in in Europe, and where you're producing it, it the the, the it only costs ten euros per ton of, of GHG that you emit, uh, you can't get away with this. You will have to pay the differential between 75 and 10. The 65 is something you will have to additionally pay for your goods to be sold in the EU jurisdiction. So this is something that is coming. As you can see, there are five sectors that are initially uh, uh, relevant for CBAM, but this is going to expand uh, and, and therefore, uh, anyone who is uh, for whom this market is important, it's really critical that you understand this and automatically, therefore, start readying yourself for ensuring that the processes that you use, the technologies that you use, is low uh, carbon emitting because that's when you you'll be able to, uh, to to sell to the EU without uh, paying a huge uh, uh, tax of this nature. So regulations uh, of, of climate are important. There are also regulations uh, relating to human rights uh, that are important in various jurisdictions. So again, EU, the UK, which of course is no longer part of the EU, they all have various requirements uh, around, around social issues, uh, human rights issues. Uh, and you, you need to make sure that you're compliant with that for these markets to be available to you. So there is a regulatory push for uh, for companies, small or large, uh, which are which are uh, who, for whom export markets are significant. That these regulations overseas are also pushing the agenda. So you have the Indian regulations on the one hand, you have the overseas regulations on the other, and so therefore uh, it becomes important to understand and and negotiate these 
But the easiest way to do this is to go down the sustainability journey. If you're already down the sustainability journey, these requirements become part of your nature. It becomes part of your DNA, and it really becomes very easy to do. So I'm going to stop there and uh, hand it back to Abha, uh, and happy to take any questions, comments, clarifications uh, that you might have. So thank you very much for your attention. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Mr. Shankar. Thank you for that comprehensive uh, presentation and uh, sharing of your perspective. Um, I would request everyone to type in their questions in the Q&A box uh, if there are any uh, queries or comments they have. Meanwhile, there are a couple of questions that we have, and I will read them out for you. Uh, there's a question on uh, life. Uh, where they're asking, is there a suggested list of good practices under that, that the companies can think of, uh, you know, in terms of beginning their journey? Uh, okay, I'm going to request both of you to also add to that. Uh, as far as I know, I think it is, there is no comprehensive list yet in place. But if you look at the kinds of issues or expectations that are there, most of these frameworks that I talked about earlier would be giving you that, those guidances as to what constitutes these, this kind of behavior. But I think the short answer is there is no list uh, there, uh, that right now that you can pick up. But I, Abha, uh, uh, Prashant, please add. No, that's a really nice question. And in fact, uh, just a, a little bit of a background. I think when Prime Minister Modi announced at COP26, you know, the whole Pancha, uh, COP26, 20, yeah, the whole Panchamrit framework. And while we have a net zero target in 2070, I think there are some very clear actions to be taken by 2030. But I think he went a step ahead and said, okay, look, that I think uh, to promote the, in a quote unquote, the Indian way of living, which is, you know, lifestyle for environment is the overarching theme, which, which the government and I think civil society in India is trying to promote. Uh, Right now, there is, and I think the, the spaces are very intuitive. You know, how do you consume less water? How do you consume less energy? How do you reuse things? How do you, uh, you know, how do you look at food differently? Maybe look at uh, more, wa less water intensive crops. So in a nutshell, I think that's the philosophy behind life, you know, more sustainable consumption and more responsible choices. Uh, there is, the space is emerging. And I can tell you honestly that, Lots of people are discussing this and putting out their lists as well. In fact, I think UNDP and uh, the Indian government just put out a list um, two weeks back at the COP. Uh, so happy to share that with you. Uh, but just to, I think the, the view for me, for an SME or for a business, would be more the ethos and philosophy of mission life and pay attention to it. Because I think that could be a space where there will be future business opportunity as well. Thank you, Prashant. That was quite comprehensive. Um, there is a question on uh, CBAM and uh, the likely or the approximate percentage of sales value uh, that could be quantified under CBAM. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can answer that. It is, it is. See, I think that what is important is the yeah, principle. I think that's, a, that's a tough question for me as well. Yeah, you know, but... One of the things which I keep hearing from well, as, as, as Shankar also mentioned, I think it's a question of uh, when and how much and not if, if it's going to come in. I think there's a lot of discussions right now happening at the EU on what is this particular value going to be, right? And uh, obviously, I think even the Indian government is working on it. But I think the general guideline I could give is it's only a question of when and how much and not a question of if. Uh, and that's the way a lot of the people I speak to are looking at it as well. Sure. So moving on to the next question. Uh, a delegate wants to know what is the status on green premiums? That is higher prices for green products abroad and in India currently. Hmm. Uh... I don't know. I, I This is not an area that I work on really. So, uh, Prashant, if you have. Yeah, I think, you know, this is a, a billion dollar question and, and uh, thank you for asking that. And 
you know, so my personal view on this one is the most success for any product or business is when there is no green premium, right? Uh, if you are putting the onus on the customer or the consumer, whoever it is, to pay a premium for your sustainability credentials, you will find a small fraction who are willing to pay a premium. But, you know, the vast majority of their people, irrespective of whether they are a large corporate or a very wealthy consumer, don't want to pay a premium, right? And whether you are in India or Europe or US, right? So the most successful businesses and brands we have always seen, and even the best examples from Unilever are always where there is not much of a premium or no premium at all. Uh, and, and the other thing which I've seen very uh, unique in particularly the Indian way of looking at sustainability, I think you can look at many sustainability as costs, which you can remove from your business, right? Whether, for instance, moving to renewables now is actually a cost advantage. So, uh, but a really good question, and, and that's the question which often gets debated on should there be a premium for sustainability? My view is if you have to pay a premium for it, it's going to be a very small market. So let the premium be small or no premium at all. Uh, I will also add to that by saying that uh, I think that uh, it is, uh, it, although intuitively it seems to suggest that uh, sustainability leads to higher costs, uh, it is not always the case. Uh, and I think it's important to think about sustainability investments as investments and not costs, uh, because they do have payback. Uh, and I think uh, if you look at uh, energy efficiency, as, uh, as Prashant talked about, is the easiest example where payback periods are in, in really in terms of months. Uh, but even other kinds of uh, uh, investments that you make uh, result in, 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 in easy uh, and very quick payback. Uh, I think the uh, challenge with a lot of these kinds of calculations and you need to be careful about them are the assumptions that go behind it. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, so, so if you look at internal carbon price as an example of how to think about, uh, uh, you know, uh, investment and making investment decisions, if you look at the number of companies that are, uh, and they're, they're sort of increasing on a daily basis as to how many of them use an internal carbon price. It is actually trying to say, look, we know that we got to go down a low carbon path. That is inevitable. Otherwise, we're going to have assets that are going to be stranded. And this is a mechanism that helps me uh, try and do that. And, and you can go on and on as to whether it should be 15 euros or 25 euros or, or, or 75 euros. And it's all a matter of debate. But the principle behind it is to think of it as an investment because everything that you if you think in the short term everything is a cost if you think in the long term everything can be an investment and i think that's the way to see it and that's the way to look at pricing and premium uh, uh, values that you could get from some of these things great um, uh, Question next next question I'd like to take up first is how would materiality apply for MSMEs? Materiality applies for everyone. Uh, it doesn't matter how big or small you are. It is a very much the first step in any form of a strategy. Uh, the simple thing is that if you look at the whole uh, set of sustainability issues that can impact your business, uh, you can go on. It will be an endless list of them. Uh, obviously, you cannot manage all of them. Obviously, there has to be a way of finding, uh, of prioritizing them, looking at and identifying those that have the higher impact so that you can focus on some of them. That process is essentially what materiality is. So it doesn't matter whether you're large or small. If you're going down a, a path and you want to be strategic about it, you have no choice but to identify what is material. How you identify materiality is a different question. And I would uh, think that a company like Unilever would uh, approach the whole process of materiality very differently from an MSM. Because it is an elaborate exercise. Larger the company, the more complex it is. So the, the comprehensiveness of the material, materiality exercise has to be greater. If you're an MSM, it has to be less. Uh, and so you don't have to necessarily follow the same methodology 
that a large company uh, does. But you still have to do materiality. I don't think there's uh, getting away from that. I just want to add one. I think that's a great answer from Shankar. And I think you have to get into that, even if you're a small SME, and particularly the reason which Shankar mentioned earlier, which is with BRSR coming in, the corporates you are supplying to, it will matter to them. I think one way you could always do it is just talk to all your stakeholders uh, you know, in your business. It could be your employees, could be your customers, could be your, uh, you know, your investors, and, and maybe make that materiality index. But uh, absolutely agree with Shankar that it applies to everybody. Thank you. Uh, the next question is rather detailed. Um, they're asking, is there a further refinement of BRSR core? where there is addition of EU's taxonomy model, net zero targets to be achieved by companies, setting up SBTIs in India to address these targets? Uh, see, it is, uh, I, I think, let me just step back a bit into the whole reporting uh, disclosure uh, logic that has been followed uh, in India. Uh, I mean, it just so happened to have been part of the journeys from uh, from 2011 when the BRR first came in. And I think what was interesting was that it was driven by the MCA. Uh, and the MCA was trying to find ways to get all companies uh, to uh, to provide what was what we then used to call non-financial uh, disclosures. Uh, but when SEBI was along the same path and thinking the same way, uh, MCA and SEBI got together and said, look, there already exists a framework. Why don't you adapt that? And that's how the BRR happened. And that's how it has evolved over time. So as you can see, uh, 100, 500, 1,000, the chances obviously are that it's going to go beyond 1,000 listed companies. But there are still a lot of questions that that. Uh, haven't been answered. What happens to unlisted companies? Uh, so clearly, uh, over a period of time, unlisted companies will also be asked to provide this kind of information because you have large unlisted companies also. Uh, so, so you will. Uh, I think the the requirement for disclosures is only going to increase. I don't think there is uh, the direction of travel is very clear. Uh, what is also interesting about the BRSR is that in the way it has been structured, uh, there is a very clear directions that is going to take. So you have essential and uh, leadership indicators. And the logic of having essential leadership indicators is over a period of time, the leadership indicators, which are voluntary at the moment, will become mandatory, will go move into essential. So that companies know that this is what I need to be tracking because now I, I voluntarily can report on it, but tomorrow I will not. So that's the basic direction of travel. Now, what has also influenced uh, both the NGRTC and therefore the BRSR is to try and make sure that it brings in, it's relevant in an Indian context. That has obviously been the case. But obviously you can't have any framework that is completely divorced from what's happening globally. So EU taxonomy will, uh, and, and, and in the future going forward, will inform the reporting framework, just like the SDGs have, uh, they've influenced the NGRBC and they've influenced the PRSR. So all of these are uh, are going to come in. The question is in what form, in which time frame. Those are questions that we don't know. We don't have answers for. BRSR is literally in its uh, infancy right now uh, because it is a huge departure from what BRR was. I would think that uh, it will be allowed to. Uh, uh, be for an, uh, for another year or two, but very soon after that will be up for a revision, and when it goes up for a revision, will include a lot more parameters than it has. Uh, but that's the direction it will go. Prashant, would you like to add to that? No, uh, not at all. I think it's uh, absolutely agree with uh, Shankar uh, on on the on the way forward. Great. Now, um, um, follow up uh, on the question on green premium. Um, Somebody is asking in circularity, how can one convince consumers to contribute? 
Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, I will leave the uh, the detail piece to uh, uh, Prashant. He's much better equipped to to respond to that. But I think when you when you, for a company that's into B two B business, it's not very hard to convince uh, uh, your buyer that this is something that you need to do. It is also logistically easier because you are moving stuff to your your customer and the reverse logistics is much easier to happen. It's much more complicated when it's a B2C business. So I don't think uh, they would require much convincing uh, in uh, to your customer if you're in the B2B business to, to sort of become part of this. It is in everybody's interest and I think that is very easily recognized. I think the important piece of circularity that we must remember and we often forget is that it's not just about uh, uh, it's not just about waste and improvement of uh, and reuse of waste. It's also about designing your product so that after use, it can be the, the all the parts can be dismantled and it can be reused. Uh, and I think that's a piece that we often don't pay enough attention to. So, so for example, I remember somebody when I was in the Tata Group and speaking to the Jaguar folks, they were telling me that the Jaguar car is so designed that if you have all the right tools, in two hours you can dismantle the whole car. Uh, now, if you can dismantle the whole car, you can imagine how low cost it is to dismantle a car. And the moment you can do that, then circularity starts becoming important. Unlike an experiment that we did in the Tata Group, where we had a whole bunch of people uh, given all the safety equipment and tools and given three printers and asked them, and we asked them to to uh, disassemble them and it was impossible to disassemble them because it was not even designed for that and if you don't even design it for disassemb easy disassembly how can you take out the parts and use them again it is almost impossible so there is a design element which we have to worry about as a company not just expect our customers to do something but our customers the business case is very easily made to our customer if it's a B2B business. But Prashant, I would ask you to speak to how it is because it's certainly more complicated when you're in the B2C business like you are in. So that's a, thank you. It's a, Shankar, it's a great question. And it's one of my uh, areas which I've taken a lot of interest over the last few years. Uh, personally, completely agree. You need to think about it at a design level. And I think that's the that's the direction which, which we are also going at Unilever. Uh, number two, I think circularity in India is a very understood concept because if you think about it, sorry, philosophically, more people, fewer resources, we are wired to do more with less, right? Um, and I think in India, uh, you know, I worked on, for instance, on bringing out the first surf Excel bottle, which was made from circular plastic. And I think intuitively all consumers got it and said, okay, look, it's great. Uh, the challenge again is the price premium. Uh, no one's willing to pay for it. In fact, on circularity, people look for a discount. Let's say you are saving money. Can you pass on some of that saving to me as well? Uh, the last point I just want to land is, um, I think what circularity is currently lacking, but I think it's going to get there, is maybe the units of measurement. Like the way you in carbon, you have a very, very clear, on emissions, you have a clear GHG number. I think on circularity as well, increasingly we are seeing that one is, of course, the kilos saved of material, but if you're able to translate it into an energy number or a carbon number, I think there is a lot more ability to charge a premium, especially in a B2B transaction. Uh, but it's an evolving space again, and, and certainly I see a lot of move changes happening in the next three years. Thank you uh, for the detailed response. I'm making an exception. We are having uh, the former chairman of Central Bank of India with us as a delegate. Uh, Mr. Tangsale uh, is here. He wanted to make a point. Uh, I think I have unmuted you, sir. Uh, would you like to come in now? Yeah, I'm audible. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, let me at the outset compliment to Shankar and Prashant both for a wonderful presentation and contribution because this is one subject uh, which has to be uh, better understood by the MSMEs also. Uh, let me give the perspective as a banker. Uh, uh, way back in 2015-16, when I was the chief executive at the IBA, we had developed the uh, guidelines on responsible finance. And this was out of the SDGs, uh, which are there related to 
other ESG. And I would like to sound uh, all my participants or my MSMEs that going forward, <clears throat> your lending coming from the banks or the NBFCs, they would demand from you that how are you compliant to the various ESG requirements? That's right. So that is one point. Mm -hmm. Second point, which I would like to tell that uh, globally, uh, all investors, if they are investing in India, they are looking for the, the credit rating on the ESG. And all the credit rating agencies in India, like Crystal and uh, others, they are all rating the agencies on the ESG also. Of course, that is going for the the the, the large corporate or the listed companies, but uh, it will be applicable to all those who are uh, getting rated by the banking industry. It means all the accounts of FICO and above where the rating is in, uh, compulsory. So having said that. I will say that uh, understanding the sustainability is extremely important. And I would like to say that uh, uh, the, the issue of sustainability is not that of the corporate or the big institution. It emanates from an individual level, simply throwing a waste <laughs> or not uh, uh, putting the waste into proper waste basket for recycling. Uh, I think we are uh, not uh, supporting the sustainability. So coming to the MSMEs, your waste management, your uh, power management, I think uh, they have already referred about the uh, alternate uh, renewable energy being used by the SMEs. So these are very important things. Uh, and as a banker, I'll repeat that going forward, the bankers are going to demand this. And maybe your uh, uh, credit rating, maybe your pricing of the uh, uh, credit will also have the factors of the ESG uh, uh, and thus MSMEs will have to understand it. That's what I thought uh, I would like to contribute. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Um, Thank you. I, we are we have actually overshot the session by 20 minutes and uh, <laughs> I, I think it would be uh, my duty to uh, draw this to a close. But before that, uh, let me thank our esteemed panelists for sharing their perspectives. Uh, we know we have the co-author co of the NVGs and the first uh, edition of BR BRR with us today, and we did not waste you, Mr. Shankar, at all. Uh, thank you for sharing your insights with us, and thank you, Prashant, for bringing in the perspective from the large company's mindset. Uh, at the FIKI Center for Sustainability Leadership, we will continue <laughs> to serve the needs of business in meeting their individual sustainable development goals. We've made a start today and in future, in the next six months, we'll be conducting multiple awareness and capacity building sessions, focusing on sustainable practices, uh, demonstrating innovative solutions targeted at climate action, compliance and disclosure requirements, waste reduction, energy efficiency, and such others. We look forward to your participation at the sessions that are relevant for you. You can also send us suggestions on what you would like us to focus on. And before uh, you log out, I would request you all to fill in the feedback using the same link so that we can understand the benefits that accrued from the session today. We would appreciate your help with this. Thank you all. So thank you, Abba. Thank you, Shankar and uh, Prashant. Uh, thank you, Abba, uh, I'm sure you will uh, share this presentation. With yes, the there are many questions. We will share the recording. We will share uh, the presentation. And uh, if there are any questions that are left unanswered, uh, you can write to us uh, at the email ID that you've been using to get in touch with us. And uh, details about the future uh, events will be hosted on the FIKI website. Please do keep checking it. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Abba. I'm exiting now. Thank sure, you. sir. Thank please, you. Thank please you remember to fill in your feedback. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, Abba. Thank you, Prashant. Thank you, Thank you all for being part of it.